When we talk about RHEL HA um, on AWS, we, we have armies available, so you can spin up an EC2 instance and it is automatically attached to all repositories you need to get the packages um, which are related to high availability. We, we use the RUI infrastructure that Simon already explained on, but the thing is, there are still there are still things to do, right? So it's not just enough to spin up an instance and then magically a cluster appears. There, there are still tasks to do. Um, and that's why we, we are developing um, a RHEL with HA partner solution. It's a ready to use cloud formation template that let you spin up a complete ready to use cluster with an overlay IP address in just a couple of minutes. Um, and when we take a look on this reference architecture, in this example, we have three availability zones, um, which means we have three cluster nodes because we deploy one node per availability zone. When you remember an availability zone is an independent data center. So from a re resiliency perspective, we ensure that in case we have issues with one availability zone, our cluster is still in a healthy state by doing that. Um, we use Bastion host to actually connect to the cluster nodes, which means when you want to access via SSH from external, your RelHA cluster, you go to the Linux Bastion host, and from there you jump to the actual cluster nodes, which reside in private subnets. Um, we have a fencing agent, so when you run a high available cluster, um, you need a mechanism to ensure that the cluster is in a healthy state, that your resources are just running on one node, that you don't have split brain scenario or something. We use a fencing agent for that, which leverages the AWS IP for health checks and also to update routing tables when we switch the failover IP address from one node to the other to ensure the IP address always stays reachable. Um, you can, that, that's just an example of how you can deploy it with free availability zones and bastion hosts, um, where we even deploy all subnets and VPC for you, but you can customize it with parameters. You can decide if you want bastion hosts or not. Maybe you want to use your own systems for that, or if you want to deploy it in an existing VPC, that's also possible. And uh, yeah, overall, the whole template does the heavy lifting for you because there are more components involved than just RHEL um, with HA in that scenario. And that being said, um, it's time for a, for a demo. <laughs> um, and as we, uh, what, what I plan to do in that demo and what we have on the other, next slide is um, actually a quick walkthrough about the um, resources that we deploy based on the architecture diagram that I showed you. And then we, we access um, a website which is delivered through a cluster virtual IP. Um, I show you how to log into the nodes and then how to initiate a failover and um, that our service is still up and running just on the other node as we would expect in high availability scenario. Okay, as promised, um, it's now time for, for our demo. Um, I tried to arrange my screen a bit to, to make it a bit easier for you to, to follow. So on, on the right-hand side, I brought up a, a small architectural diagram which reflects the, the demo environment. So, so I picked a two-node cluster. So I have a node in availability zone one, a node in availability zone two, and I have one bastion host um, in availability zone one. Um, on the left side of my browser, um, I opened the CloudFormation stack. Um, in case you're not familiar with CloudFormation yet, um, as Simon already pointed out, it's based, it's JAML based um, or JSON, depends what you prefer. I prefer JAML. Um, so you're going to write nice looking templates like that one. Um, you don't need to understand all these things um, and it will probably take a bit longer than a couple of minutes to walk you through all this. But all this defines what we want to achieve. So CloudFormation is declarative. So we tell CloudFormation what we want as an outcome, as a result, and it goes ahead and deploys things for us. Um, the whole 
stack of our partner solution is built on so-called nested stacks. That means every step that we take, deploying a VPC, deploying Bastion host, deploying a cluster node, is its own so-called nested stack. Um, you can see that here on the left side, I can step through them. Um, that's interesting to know, but it's not super important for you because when you want to customize it, um, you actually pass parameters to the main template. Um, you can, for example, customize your um, cluster name, the cluster password. You can define which floating IP address, so which cluster IP you want, um, instance types, internal node names, a lot of different things. And when we take a look in the CloudFormation Designer real quick, um, this is what happens under the hood. So when we start the deployment and we say, yeah, deploy a new VPC for me, for example, then we have a VPC stack. And this VPC stack will ensure that I have my virtual private cloud, that I have my public subnets, that I have my private subnets, that I have my NAT gateway, so that everything which is network related is already configured for me. The next step is then the Bastion host. If I say, yes, I want a Bastion host, it will go ahead and create an auto-scaling group, creates Bastion host, ready for me to log in. And then I have my actual cluster nodes. It starts with the first node, and then there comes a second node. If I decide to have a free node cluster, there comes another node, and so on. A quick look into the networking part, and I use our new resource map feature um, under VPC for that, because I think it's um, super convenient to see what's going on. So when we take a look on the architecture on the right side, we have two public subnets. Um, these public subnets share one routing table, and I can see it here as well. So I have my availability zone, EU central 1A. I have a public subnet, and this public subnet has a routing table attached. And when I hover over that public subnet, I see that my other public subnet uses the same routing table. Then we have two private subnets. Um, these are the subnets where the actual cluster node is, is in. And each of these uh, private subnets has its own routing table attached to a NAT gateway. And these routing tables contain one very, very important routing information for us. Um, it's this one, 10.1.1. 0 slash 32, that's our cluster IP. That's the IP address that we move between nodes in case of a failover so that our service that runs on top of the nodes stays available. Um, you can see that there is a routing which links to an ENI, to a network interface. And as soon we fail over from one node to the other, the fencing agent will update these routing tables and ensure that this entry points to the other node, to the new active node. What I said earlier, we have um, three EC2 instance in that design, in that, in that demo deployment. We have our Linux Bastion host, that's the host where I SSH into to actually reach my cluster nodes. And then I have node one, and node two. Another thing that I briefly want to touch on is security. Um, for obvious reasons, we need to allow cluster nodes to shut down other cluster nodes. When you have a high availability cluster and a node is in an unhealthy state and another node want to become the new um, leader, the new elected leader in your cluster, and want to take over the resources, we need to ensure that the failed node, the unhealthy node, is powered off and restarted. So we need to grant access. And important is that we narrow down that access as much as possible. As you can see here, um, every node is allowed to read some information from EC2. So I can read information from an instance. I can read the status from an instance. 
but only the two cluster nodes, no other EC2 instance in your VPC is allowed to actually stop and start these instances. So there's no wildcard entry, which allows <laughs> two broad permissions. We really narrow it down and follow the best practices of, of least um, privileged permissions. Um, the same thing counts for overlay IP address. Um, we limit it to the specific routing tables. So the cluster nodes can only update the routing tables that belong to the solution and nothing else. So one thing that I want to show you is actually how the cluster behaves when we fail over the cluster IP. What I prepared here is um, an alias to our cluster IP, relHA. And under that alias, I get a website. The website shows me the information of the node, which is, um, yeah, which is running this resource at that point. So when I refresh that, I see, okay, node one um, is obviously delivering that page. When we take a look into the console, that, that's my cluster node one. I check the cluster health status. I can see that's my RelHA cluster. I have two nodes, both are online, node one, node two. And here I have my cluster IP address. It says it's started, so it's available and it's running on this IP address. Let's take a look. Yes, it's my node one. I can also double check it by taking a look in the IP configuration and I see, yes, my cluster IP address is available on, on this node. I mean, that's great. Um, let's see what happens when we fail over. So right now I can ping it. I have my website available. When I go to my cluster node and say, I want to move this resource to another cluster node, which is basically the same thing that would happen when I have a failover due to time concerns during the demo, we just moved the resource. I start it. It says, yes, I move it. When I refresh that page, you see it takes a second. I have a short um, interruption in my ping, which is expected because we're now moving these website from one node to the other node. Ping is back. The website now shows node two as you note, it delivers that service and we can double check it. I'm here on my second node. Take a look in my cluster status and that's my IP address. I see it started, but the IP address changed. The service is now delivered from the second cluster node. And this is just a demonstration how easy it is to move a resource from one node to the other, to have high availability and all these capabilities are available as soon as you deploy um, from our partner solution. So this is exactly the state that you have um, when you use the Rail with HA partner solution. And this is actually what I wanted to present and share with you today.